Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's COVID-19 update webinar. Two housekeeping notes before we get started. Please enter your questions through the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will get to them as time allows. Also, please take a moment to complete the survey once the program has ended. To get today's program started, I'll hand it over to Andy Bobrick. Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be with you again today. We have a, a great group assembled to talk about uh, various issues, some related to COVID and some others that are we think of interest to you and developing and relevant. I, I do wanna uh, just mention uh, two things. First, of course, we appreciate you being with us. Uh, we expect to continue these, these weekly webinars. And of course, we wanna be responsive uh, and keep it interesting for you. If you have a topic, and, and by that I mean a general topic uh, that you would like us to present on, could you just include it in, in a comment and send it to us? We'll take a look at those after the webinar and, and just as a heading put, uh, perhaps, or an intro put next week topic and just let us know what you're interested in hearing about. And as I mentioned, we'll take that under consideration and see what we can do. To kick things off with our panel, Pete Jones is going to be presenting. As many of you probably saw, there was a very uh, significant and notable uh, union election involving one of Amazon's facilities. And Pete wanted to talk to you all today a little bit about that. Pete, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Andy. Uh, it's good to be back with everybody today. Um, as Andy mentioned, I uh, assume that people are going to have some general familiarity with this, but let me just run through some of the background fa facts, uh, tell you what happened, and then offer a couple of observations about why I think this may be relevant and important to, to all of us. So first of all, this was an Amazon uh, warehouse facility in Alabama, um, a very large facility, 5,800 plus warehouse workers were in the uh, petition for bargaining unit. The union in question was the Retail Wholesale Department Store Workers Union. So they filed a petition with the NLRB seeking to represent this very large bargaining unit. Um, one of the things, um, and I saw some articles on this where people said, oh no, not another mail ballot election and you know issues with uh, the counting of ballots, but the NLRB has been conducting uh, elections primarily by mail ballot since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. The NLRB has long had Mail ballot, mail ballot provisions, but use them rather sparingly. There's been a preference for in-person voting in NLRB elections. Um, but this particular election was a mail ballot election. Um, and the results you could see here on your screen, um, 76 void ballots. In, in some cases that could be an entire bargaining unit, but here it was a rather, you know, an insignificant uh, number relative to the, to the size of the group. 738 people voted in favor of the petitioner, in favor of unionization. Um, 1,798, almost 1,800 voted against the petitioner. 505 were what we call challenged ballots. Uh, the number of challenged ballots plus the number in favor of unionization are insignificant or not significant enough to overcome uh, the votes against it. And so um, the, the outcome of the vote is that the, the union organization drive is defeated. Um, Ashley, if you could go to the next slide, please. So let's take a step back, if we could, and just uh, you know talk a little bit about NLRB election principles generally. Um, this would be relevant for those of you who uh, are not yet unionized um, or um, who have um, uh, the potential for a residual, bar residual bargaining unit in your facility. You may end up with, you could end up with a union uh, election petition um, and a proceeding. So the NLRB is a neutral government agency. They conduct these elections. First thing they do is determine the appropriateness of the bargaining unit. And there's a principle at play here uh, that is borne out over time. The larger the bargaining unit, the more difficult it traditionally has been for unions to achieve organizing success. So we've seen a move in recent years toward unions trying to seek smaller units. Uh, so-called micro units to, to uh, see if they might have a better chance of success at organizing smaller uh, groups of employees where um, less votes are needed uh, to command a majority of the group. 
Uh, it's historically been the case, and it was certainly the case here in the Amazon situation, where um, an informational campaign was conducted um, and the union is objected. We'll talk about that in just a second to the employer's conduct during that campaign. Um, what happens at the end of that is that the votes get counted and then there's a possibility of election challenges um, prior to the certification of the results. Pending the outcome of the entire process, the bargaining is either going to start because there's a recognized bargaining representative or non-union status will be maintained. Um, so those are the background principles. Okay, so what's new here? Um, probably everybody's heard a little bit about this, but uh, the union in this case filed 23 objections. And remember that thing that we've always talked about over the years, a number of you have probably sat in on these presentations, perhaps even conducted these presentations, but um, no tips during a union organizing campaign, no threats, no interrogation, no promises, no surveillance, no discrimination against um, uh, people based upon their support or lack of support for the union. Now, this is alleged misconduct by the union. I wanna be very clear here that I don't know uh, that these things have happened. And frankly, these things have been denied, I believe, by Amazon. And so this is just the allegations, a summary of the allegations, but that there were threats of job losses, that there were allegations of unfair treatment, that there were benefits, not just promises, but actually that promises were made good upon, um, and that there were surveillance. Um, and, um, and all of these things form the basis for these 23 uh, broad election objections. Just to give you a little flavor for it, um, what actually happened here uh, is the NLRB had ruled over Amazon's objection that they would do a mail ballot election. Amazon then uh, prevailed upon the United States Postal Service to put a, um, a, you know, a mailbox, a U.S. Postal Service mailbox on site to make it easier for people to vote. Um, and the union is now alleged that uh, that Amazon has implied um, that 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 is somehow under the control of Amazon and that that would influence the outcome of the election. So we've got two different sides looking at the same set of facts and coming to a very different uh, conclusion. Possible outcomes here. The election could be certified election victory for Amazon possibility of a rerun election. Um, and in some unique circumstances the possibility of a bargaining order. I apologize uh, for the background noise. Uh, looks like we, we got a fire truck situation here in Syracuse. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so just the, the, the bigger picture, and I wanna leave you with this. Uh, less elections were held last year, I think because of the pandemic, um, well below the trend, which has been decreasing over time. So we've seen union elections trending downward annually for years. And last year was even more precipitous, um, probably as a result of the pandemic. Um, I think the Amazon situation represents a very common fact scenario. That is, election results are often challenged by one party or another. Um, but this particular election has captured the attention of many as somewhat of a bellwether for the future of union organizing. And could, could, could the union movement reverse trends that have happened over time? Um, or would they struggle to organize such a large bargaining unit? Um, you're all probably aware, but let me just give you the highlights. In light of the declining unionization over the years and the support of some officials, including the Biden administration, of unionization as a means to lift up the overall economy, we've got the PRO Act, um, uh, which has been proposed and has passed the House and, and likely will not have the votes to pass the Senate. Um, there's some highlights in there. It would alter state right to work laws. It would change the election procedures and would have affected what would have been permissible conduct by Amazon um, in this case. It provides for arbitration for first contracts because one of the objections that unions have had historically is it's hard to get a first contract where all the issues are on the table. And so arbitration would ensure that a first contract gets put in place, even if the parties couldn't agree, and it would increase the penalties for violations during organizing. So kind of an interesting thing, big thing going on, um, you know, in the, in the world of labor uh, may have implications for um, employers generally, we'll have to keep our eye on this. 
Um, that's the update on that one. Um, Andy, I'll send it back to you. Great, Pete. Thanks, thanks a lot. I know a lot of our clients are keeping their eyes on uh, that legislation in particular. There was some political activity yesterday on it, some support expressed by uh, more moderate uh, members of the Senate. I, I guess, you know, in my mind, it, it, it begs the question of, is, is this the bill that ultimately leads to the elimination of the filibuster and revamping of the Senate rules to uh, allow it to pass with a, with a mere majority? Uh, I, I guess, you know, Jerry's out on that. Um, we'll have to wait and see it. I'm not hearing that and seeing it, but I think the other piece too is that some of these uh, provisions in the PRO Act might be stripped out and included in other uh, omnibus pieces of legislation. So uh, if you haven't looked at this already, uh, clients and friends, I would encourage you to, to do it. Uh, we could see some form of it uh, ahead in the future. So thanks, Pete. Next, I want to introduce my colleague, John Gotso. Uh, John it works in our Buffalo office and practices in the employee benefits area. Uh, great to have you with us here today, John. And John's going to talk a little bit about some of the more recent developments dealing with the COBRA subsidy. And I, for one, am glad that you can explain this, John, and have a handle on it. So I can call you when I need help. Thanks, Andy. Absolutely. Glad to help. Uh, as if many of you may be aware, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 included a COBRA subsidy provision. Now, we've reported on this before. Uh, I want to give you some highlights and new updates today, but just give you broad strokes of what the law generally requires is that this is a 100% COBRA subsidy that applies during the period from April 1 to September 30 with respect to qualifying events that were either an involuntary termination or reduction in hours. Now it applies to most group health plans and most employers, even small employers. So most employers need to be aware of this and, and understand what their obligations are over the next six months or so. Uh, the recent development that we wanna report on today is that part of the statute or a provision of the statute directed the DOL to issue model notices to provide in connection with the ARPA subsidy and directed the DOL to do that by April 10th. So the DOL just got in by uh, the skin of their, uh, you know, just barely in on, on April 7th uh, with these notices with respect to uh, ARPA. Um, and now they're available on the website, uh, which we've, we've provided to you. So what are these model notices and how are they supposed to be used by us as, as employers? Um, first of all, you need to recognize if you've worked with the, the model notices previously, they need to be customized. I mean, these are the same, they look and have the same feel as your, as your uh, model notices that you may be traditionally using with respect to your, your COBRA obligations, but they do need to be customized. So it's not something you could just send out the door looking at the, at the model notices. Um, there's five of them that, that were provided by the DOL. We're gonna just walk quickly through them and, and give you some, some general information uh, regarding the notices, uh, just so you have a, have a feel of what, they, what you may need to do with these notices in the future. First is the Model General Notice and COBRA Continuation Coverage Election Notice. And this is really going to replace or supplement your normal election notice that you may be currently using with respect to COBRA. So this provides information regarding the subsidy as well as general information regarding electing COBRA. Now this is gonna be provided to both people who are potentially subsidy eligible individuals. So that would mean folks who are involuntarily terminated or folks who have a reduction hours as well as anyone else who has a COBRA qualifying event. So this is really gonna go out to all your qualified beneficiaries during this COBRA subsidy period. Second notice is this model notice in connection with extended election period. Uh, for folks who are familiar with this re COBRA requirement, it has a look back feature to it as well. So not only with respect to new COBRA qualified beneficiaries on April 1st going forward, we also have to look back to people who either are on COBRA already or previously were offered COBRA and either elected or didn't elect and whose COBRA coverage period would extend into this COBRA subsidy period. So that would be the April 1 to September 30 period that we're talking about. Um, so this is kind of the second bite of an apple notice. And this is really one where I think the employers will have to do some work on to identify those individuals who need to be provided with a second chance notice and then deliver it to applicable former employees. 
The third notice is something called the model alternative notice. And that's basically a notice that's used for those uh, employers that are subject to state mini COBRA laws. So the first two notices are really uh, supplements to the federal COBRA provisions. This model notice or model alternative notice would be applicable with respect to a state mini COBRA law. So for example, if you're a, a small employer in New York, less than 20 employees and subject to New York state mini COBRA, this would be the notice that you're using with respect to uh, notifying folks about the, the ARPA subsidy. Uh, the model notice of expiration of premium assistance. This is really a, a new notice uh, that applies. It was not previously part of the, the COBRA statute and it's, met, it's designed to provide individuals with notice of the fact that the subsidy is expiring. So in most circumstances, this might be provided prior to the end of September 30th. And when the subsidy ends, you have to provide it between 15 and 45 days prior to the end of the subsidy. Um, so that's in most circumstances where you'll be using this. You also use this if someone's uh, COBRA period ends within the subsidy period, meaning be, their COBRA period might expire, for example, on July, at the end of July, you'd have to provide this notice to that individual prior to the expiration of that COBRA period as well. The final notice is the summary of COBRA premium assistance provisions under the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. So, so what is this? This is really a supplement notice that's provided and provides the basics of uh, the ARPA subsidy. It also includes a, a certification that the employee must complete in order to uh, basically say or request eligibility for the subsidy. So one of the provisions in, in the subsidy law, in the ARPA law, is that you are not eligible for the subsidy to the extent that you are eligible for other group health plan coverage with some exceptions, for example, for a health flexible spending account or accepted benefits. But in general, if you're, if you're eligible for other major medical plan coverage, you're not eligible for the subsidy. Also, if you're eligible for Medicare, you're not eligible for the subsidy. So this summary asks the employee to make that representation or former employee to make that representation where they're eligible for these other types of coverage that would then make them ineligible for, for the subsidy. So that's an important piece of the COBRA package that you're going to be sending out to your qualified beneficiaries uh, in order to have that information regarding the subsidy. So the, in general, the, you know, the big picture here, I think, is that these are very helpful uh, for employers. Um, the DOL also issued in connection with these, these model notices, some FAQs uh, regarding the COBRA subsidy. And this is really the first piece of guidance other than the general notices that will provide you some information regarding the subsidy. This is really the first piece of guidance that the federal departments have issued in connection with the subsidy following the statute itself. And while it does provide clarity uh, on certain issues, uh, there certainly are some issues that are that are still unknown and we're waiting for or hopeful to have additional guidance uh, regarding uh, some of the, the unclear provisions in the law. Uh, if you step back to 2009, there was a similar COBRA subsidy provision in the law uh, where the IRS issued pretty comprehensive uh, FAQs about, for example, what will qualify as an involuntary termination under that law. We're hopeful that we'll get updated guidance similar to that 2009 guidance um, because the FAQs that were issued in connection with the the model notices are not as complete as that, as that prior guidance. But in any event, they, they do provide some clarity on a few issues, and I'll touch on some of them right now. One, one issue is uh, folks who are used to working with COBRA may know that in addition to the ARPA subsidy, there's also a provision out there that delays the time, and this is really COVID relief, delays the time in which qualified beneficiaries are required to make their COBRA election. And in general, we're not going to go into the ins and outs of that relief, but in general, you have a year from this COVID relief provided a year in which to make that election, or if the national emergency ends earlier than that, a shorter time period. It's pretty, it's clear, not pretty, it's clear in the, in the notices that are provided uh, by the DOL in the summary that that one year extension for COVID related relief does not apply to uh, elections that may be made for COBRA for purposes of the subsidy. That subsidy provision still requires a qualified beneficiary to make an election within 60 days. So they don't have this extended election period in, in which to make an election to get the subsidy. The 60 day period is applicable 
with respect to the ARPA subsidy. And that 60 day runs from the date that the individual receives the COBRA notice uh, informing them of the subsidy. So that, that's one clarification that was helpful in the FAQs. Another clarification that was helpful, uh, we talked about just a minute ago about the fact that you are ineligible for the subsidy to the extent that you are eligible for other group health plan coverage or Medicare. Uh, there was some question of what, well, what does that mean? What other coverage could that be? Am, am I ineligible if I'm eligible through uh, spouse's plan, for example? And the FAQs clarified that that is true. If you're eligible for coverage under a spouse's plan, you are not eligible for the subsidy. Uh, so there was some additional information on, on that perspective as, as far as who is subsidy eligible. And again, in that summary, there is a certification that the former employee will need to complete about eligibility for, for other coverage. What areas are we still looking for, for guidance on and, and hopefully we'll receive? Um, one is, what is an involuntary termination? As I mentioned, back in 2009, there was some guidance issue that, that we can at least look at and say, well, hopefully the IRS will provide us uh, similar guidance in this vein or use it as a measuring point for, for making conclusions at this point. But there is no clear definition of what is an involuntary termination of employment. And it's not clear in all circumstances whether termination is involuntary or voluntary. Uh, for example, you might have a situation where you have an early retirement incentive. If someone takes that as a voluntary termination or involuntary termination. So there's a lot of close calls in connection with what can be an involuntary termination. I will say that in the 2009 guidance, for the most part, where there was a close call uh, the DOL, it was actually the IRS guidance, erred on the side of deeming something to be an involuntary termination. So that's kind of where the departments leaned with respect to uh, the involuntary or voluntary determination. We're hopeful to see guidance regarding you know, what they might be with respect to ARPA. Um, the other big area that we're hopeful to get guidance on is, as I mentioned, there is this look back period uh, with respect to identifying individuals who have to receive this second bite of the apple type notice, this extended election notice. Um, and it, when you look at the law, it generally provides, it needs to be provided to those individuals who have an involuntary termination or reduction in hours, uh, but whose COBRA subsidy period would extend into the April 1 to September 30 um, subsidized period. So when you look at that, when you look at general federal COBRA, that's an 18 month period. However, it's possible if you look, if, under COBRA to have, for example, a disability extension that gets you up to 29 months of COBRA. And it's also possible to have a second qualifying event that would get you up to 36 months of COBRA. So at this point, it's not clear whether you have to go all the way back to 36 months, for example, to identify those individuals who may be eligible to get the extended election notice and elect COBRA or not. We're hopeful that additional guidance will be provided by the IRS on that point. Similarly, for us in New York, for example, who are under uh, for a large insured plan, if, if you're an insured plan, uh, New York state law provides for 36 months of COBRA coverage. Now, generally for, for a large plan, you're subject to federal COBRA, but you have this additional add-on of 18 months to get to that 36 months. Unclear again about whether you need to go back to the full 36 months to identify those individuals who might be COBRA subsidy eligible, or if it's just based on the 18 month standard, we're hopeful for guidance on that in, in the future as well. So that's a big issue I think that, that employers and, and we're working through as well and looking for guidance on how far this look back period is. I think as I've ended on a couple other speeches related to this, uh, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have more clarifying guidance in order to make those determinations because it would certainly be welcome uh, by all plan sponsors. Great, John, thanks so much. Uh, good to know we're getting some guidance and uh, hopefully there'll be more along the way. I'm, I'm sure you'll be uh, willing to come back once we get that. Uh, and I think you covered a lot of the questions that have been asked too by the audience, so thank you. Next up today, we have uh, one of our new associate trainees, Brittany Frank, who works in our Garden City office with us. Uh, Brittany is going to talk about some of the school issues uh, that are happening. We have a number of school district clients uh, who are on this webinar, and we also have a lot of uh, parents and uh, those who have loved ones at schools these days. So it's always good to get uh, more information and updates about some of the recent things we're seeing there. Brittany, thanks a lot for being here today. 
Hi, thank you for the introduction. It's good to be here. Um, so last Wednesday, the New York Department of Health provided an overview of the interim guidance for schools that was released on April 9th. Um, and towards the end of the presentation, they answered a number of questions that are frequently asked. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight a few of those questions and the answers that were given. Um, the first question was, during lunch, when face masks are not worn, can barriers be used to permit students to sit within six feet of one another? Um, and are barriers included as an option for physical distancing under this new guidance? Um, and the answer that was given was that under this new guidance, barriers are not recommended. Six feet of distance is required at times when eating meals or drinking or at any other time when masks must be removed. Um, so this may mean that uh, meals can't be eaten in classrooms that have been converted to three feet of physical distancing during instruction time. Um, another question that was asked was, are masks only mandatory when six feet of distancing cannot be maintained, but may be removed when individuals are at least six feet from one another? Um, the answer is that masks are required at all times except during meals. Um, and then moving on to another question. So the interim guidance states that faculty may instruct more than one cohort as long as appropriate physical distancing is maintained. Um, does this mean that secondary classes that move from period to period are cohorted if they contain the same students for the full school year? The answer was that as long as the cohort, co sorry, as long as the cohorts are in fixed or pre-assigned groups of students with reasonable group size limits, um, and those size limits are outlined in the school's plan. Secondary classes that move from period to period meet the definition of a cohort, um, and reasonable efforts should be made to prevent intermig intermingling between cohorts um, to the extent possible, and to make sure the cohorts are fixed for the entirety of the school year. Um, the next question is, how is a district to determine its level of community transmission? Um, the CDC metrics and state data are both publicly available. Um, the ultimate decision by school districts to reduce physical distancing in classrooms will come down to a local community's risk tolerance based on its own unique circumstances. Um, so schools should work with their health departments to have an understanding of their community rate of transmission, and this should drive decision making. Um, districts should look at the publicly available data sources. Um, if three feet is permissible, are we still quarantining anyone within six feet of a COVID positive individual? Um, so yeah, so even though um, students are permitted to sit three feet from one another in classrooms for the purpose of contact tracing, the six foot close contact rule still applies. So contact tracers will continue to look for individuals who have been within six feet of a positive case for at least 10 minutes within a 24 hour period, even if masks are properly worn. So that should be taken into consideration as schools determine how to update their plans. Great, Brittany, thanks so much for that update. We appreciate it. I know uh, here in Central New York anyway, a lot of our schools have gone back to um, near full, full-time in-person learning. Uh, so far, so good here, uh, as it seems in Central New York. Hope, hope the same is true. I know uh, so many of our clients uh, in that area have been working hard to, uh, to bring uh, this change. Next, we have Paul Bueller. We are getting still quite a few inquiries uh, every day about unemployment related matters, uh, including uh, some of the fraud issues that have persisted. Uh, Paul today is just gonna give us a quick update and uh, flag some issues for your attention. Paul, thanks. Thanks, Andy. So yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about 
some of the fraudulent unemployment claims that we've all seen. Um, you know, and at the outset, the first thing that I always recommend that employers do is make sure that they've properly identified a fraudulent claim. So from my perspective, that is, you know, you're doing your due diligence, reviewing all of the monthly statements that you receive um, related to everyone who is receiving unemployment benefits that is a former employee of yours um, or a current employee of yours. Um, you know, we all know that DOL canceled um, unemployment benefit charges against employer accounts, but they're still sending those monthly statements and we should still do our diligence and reviewing those to make sure that all of those claims are A, uh, you know, proper, they're not something we want to contest and B, that they're legitimate, they're not fraudulent, not something that we need to report to the fraud division. Um, a couple things to kind of consider as you're trying to identify whether a claim is fraudulent. Um, you know, one thing to think about is let's say you have an employee who resigns and then they take another job and they quickly um, are fired or resigned from that position. So that's what I mean here by consider interim employers. In a lot of situations, um, if they only worked for that interim employer for a very brief period, DOL will charge not just their interim employer, um, but they'll also charge those unemployment backs and unemployment benefits back to you guys. Um, you know, this happens every once in a while. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot that we can do about it. You know, it's still a situation where you want to try and contest, um, but it's not a situation where employers have a lot of success in, in contesting. Um, the other thing to, to consider is when you have a situation where someone might be eligible for partial benefits. So you might have a current employee who works a reduced schedule and is still receiving some amount of partial unemployment benefits. Um, and those are not necessarily fraudulent claims because it is possible for someone to work a reduced schedule and still receive unemployment. Um, so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but there's a new test for partial unemployment, new criteria. It used to be that if you earned less than $504 a week um, and you worked less than four days in a week, you could receive partial benefits. And it was basically, if you worked four days a week, you got nothing. If you worked three days a week, you could get 25% benefits. Uh, two days a week, you could get 50. One day a week, you get 75. And no work at all would give you 100% benefits. Um, of, of course, I'll be sub subject to that $504 cap. They've changed the criteria now, so it's an hours-based approach. And anyone who works less than 30 hours a week um, and again, earns less than that $504 a week can be eligible for partial unemployment benefits. Um, we've got a little asterisk here next to 30 hours simply because there's also kind of a strange cap on the number of hours someone can work in a single day um, counted towards those 30 hours. DOL says that if you work 10 or more hours in a single day, you should only report that you worked 10 hours. So if you have someone who works a 12 hour shift um, twice a week, Typically, that should be 24 hours of work, but DOL says that they should only report 20 hours um, when they fill out their, their unemployment certification. So as you're trying to determine if someone, you know, if there's a fraudulent claim filed in the name of one of your current employees, always, you know, look at this criteria, make sure that they're not someone who is actually eligible for partial benefits. Okay, and we can move on to the next slide. So once you've identified a claim as fraudulent, the first thing to do is just kind of gather all the relevant information that you're going to need to, to provide to the fraud division to demonstrate to them this is a fraudulent claim. Um, you know, and just at the most basic level, that's going to be things like payroll records, time cards, um, and your unemployment statements. That way you can show, you know, this is a claim on behalf of a current employee they were paid, you know, showing their pay statement saying, okay, here, they made more than $504 a week. They should not be getting any benefits or here are their time cards that show they worked more than 30 hours. Um, and so if they're reporting that they worked less than 30 hours, or if this is a claim that was made by, you know, some third party person who was able to, you know, find out a social security number of one of your employees. Um, you know, again, these are all things you can do to show that, you know, this is a fraudulent claim. And if you gather all that information at the outset, it makes your job a lot easier as you're you're going through the process. The other thing that I always recommend just as a best practice, um, and this isn't specific to fraud, but I always like to keep a spreadsheet of all your active claims, um, you know, where they are in the process, what the upcoming next deadline is, because there are very important deadlines in terms of contesting benefits. And sometimes if you miss one, um, you know, DOL won't necessarily let you let you file things late. So that way you can keep track of all your active claims, including any that are fraudulent, 
so you can track where you are in the process and know, you know, this is what I provided to DOL. Here's when I provided it. Um, here's the next deadline. Like I said, deadlines in, in these situations are, are very, very important. All right, so we can move on to the next slide here. So in terms of actually reporting, um, you know, there is a fraud hotline. You can call someone and speak to them. We've also, you know, independently directly spoken with contacts of the DOL from the fraud division, um, but they've basically assured us that the quickest, easiest way for, to, for everyone to report fraudulent claims is simply to report it through their online uh, fraud portal. So we've got a link here um, for how to do that, and you should be able to provide all the information that, that they need to, to show that the claim is fraudulent. Um, they also strongly recommend, um, and you should you should encourage any employees who have had fraudulent claims made in their name um, to report that to the Federal Trade Commission because that is considered an instance of identity theft. And they may also want to contact the local police uh, simply because the one critical piece of information to every application for unemployment benefits is a social security number. And so if somebody has a fraudulent unemployment claim filed in their name, that means their social security number has been compromised. Um, and of course, that's one of the most critical pieces of personal information that we all have. So again, you want to independently report this to the fraud division. You can encourage the employee to also report this to the fraud division. Um, again, if it's this third party person who has you know, compromised their social security number in that situation, again, encourage them to report this to the Federal Trade Commission and to contact the police because this is identity theft. Um, and we can just move on to the next slide here. So the other thing to consider here is that, you know, while these fraudulent claims, you know, hopefully will be all removed from the account if you can demonstrate um, that they were improperly assessed against your account or anything like that. But, but also keep in mind that DOL, at least until further notice, has removed all charges from employer accounts. And so from a practical perspective, that means, for example, for you self-insured employers um, that use the benefit reimbursement model and, and pay out of pocket, because these charges have been assessed to the general account, you're not going to get a direct bill uh, for this money. It doesn't mean you shouldn't contest it. It just means that luckily you're not going to have to pay out of pocket for these fraudulent claims right now. Um, but the, the one caveat there is that the DOL could rescind this cancellation at any time. And so moving forward, um, you know, it's still really important to do your due diligence, review your monthly statements, make sure that there aren't fraudulent claims being assessed against you because when DOL decides to reinstate the normal process um, and start charging employers, whether it's against their experience rating or it's, you know, the benefit reimbursement model you paying out of pocket. Um, either way, you don't want to be on, a hook, on the hook for that money when the DOL starts going through the normal process again. The last thing I wanted to mention is just a few things that you can encourage the employee to do. Um, so when someone receives unemployment benefits, um, typically that is subject to income tax federally and in New York State. Um, the American Rescue Plan had an exemption for a small amount of those unemployment benefits. I think it was the first $10,200 um, only for individuals who earn less than $150,000 um, was exempt from federal income tax under the American Rescue Plan. Um, if someone received more than that, which is very possible, um, given you know the the extensions and how people could receive unemployment benefits for a long period of time um, it's very possible that someone would exceed that ten thousand two hundred dollar threshold and because you know if it's a fraudulent claim and the individual didn't actually receive the money because it was taken by you know some nefarious third party um, they're going to get a 1099 saying that they receive this money and they have to pay tax on it so there is a process and procedure for doing that, um, and you ask for what's called a 1099-G review. Um, so basically, one, if that 1099 comes through saying you were paid X dollars in unemployment benefits, um, you basically have to ask the IRS to review, um, and theoretically, they won't make you pay income tax on the money because you never, never received it. Um, and the last thing that I just encourage everyone to do uh, is just a best practice for everyone, not necessarily anyone who's had a fraudulent claim assessed against them, um, but just protecting your identity, safeguarding passwords, um, you know, monitoring your credit report. There are tons of, of easy 
uh, resources to get a free rec credit report, whether it's going directly to TransUnion or Experian, you're entitled to those, I think, once a year for free. Um, a lot of credit cards and bank accounts also include that as well. They let you monitor it once a week, once a month, whatever it happens to be. Um, and of course, there are third party um, identity protection resources and things like that. So those can all help for people to you know, prevent these fraudulent claims and also to help kind of rehabilitate your credit and, and your identity if your identity has been compromised. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of questions and interest on this. And what, what I would suggest is uh, we'll take a look at those questions and maybe have you back to try to address some of them that might be of general interest. I think uh, one sentiment that I, I hear and I've heard otherwise is the difficulty that uh, employers, you know, when advocating on behalf of their employees, are trying to help or having with contacting a live person or getting through or seeing any type of timely action from the Department of Labor. Uh, that's been my experience. Uh, my sense is, you know, they've been overwhelmed with the volume of, of work there, and I'm not aware of any uh, secret way through or or um, magic passageway to figure these things out, but. Uh, you tell me if, if, uh, if I'm wrong here. Otherwise, I think what you should do is contact your bond attorney, contact Paul, and uh, there are some things that we may be able to do to help. But are you aware of any, any magic passageway through the uh, bureaucracy at all, Paul? <laughs> um, unfortunately, no. I mean, just keep trying. And if you're not having success, let us know. There are a handful of people who have been great points of contact for me and, and for other people here at Bond who have been able to, you know, they've gone above and beyond, I think, their, their mandate as DOL employees to assist us. So just let us know if you're having trouble. Great. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. All right. Katie Anderson, how are you? I'm always, I'm always ready. Okay. <laughs> That's what She's I am. ready. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> Don't Katie, worry. Good to have you with us. I know we're at the end. So, uh, yeah, no, that's okay. We, uh, we'll run a few minutes over here. Why don't you, why don't you walk us through what you got? Perfect. So, uh, continuing with the good news, we're seeing a decrease in cases, uh, throughout New York state, Western New York is having some issues with their case numbers, but again, we're finally getting, uh, lower than, um, you know, we almost got there in March, but then we had this spike. Um, now it seems as though the vaccination efforts are really working well um, to, to show us. For example, we're, you know, this, we're looking at 43% of New Yorkers have received their first shot, 29% are fully vaccinated. Uh, it's great news. And, uh, you know, the, the thing that the current pace of vaccinations did get slowed down because of uh, the pullback of Johnson and Johnson. Um, the reason, you know, that you, we discussed Johnson and Johnson last week. The news update with Johnson and Johnson is uh, Dr. Fauci said that a decision uh, regarding the Johnson and Johnson vaccine should be coming this Friday, and that he expects that there will be either a warning or restriction on the use of the vaccine. So, like we discussed last week, limiting it to um, a certain population, uh, whether it's older, uh, like they did the AstraZeneca vaccine, or based on uh, gender. Those will be developments. I'm sure I will be talking about them next week. Um, reopenings. We did have some more reopening news occur in the past week. So looking at now a 12 a.m. curfew for restaurants and bars. Restaurants and bars are the only uh, industry with a curfew. Movie theaters capacity can go up to 33% starting April 26th. The same thing with low risk indoor and outdoor arts and entertainment. They can increase up to 50%. I saw a question in there about how this applies to libraries. It's going to depend if you're a public library or not. I, I'm, I would give a call to your attorney to talk about that one. Um, on May 19th, we're seeing large scale arenas and events venues. Those will increase up to 25%. They are currently limited to 20%. Um, and th those will be, you know, that, that's coming in a month. Travel, uh, just a reminder, New York is following the CDC guidance regarding international travel, and the CDC guidance says that there is no quarantine required for asymptomatic international travel. We've seen a lot of people being confused about that. Um, it does seem like a pretty big reversal, but that is 
uh, something to remember, asymptomatic international travel, it doesn't matter whether or not you're vaccinated. Um, they are recommending that people be vaccinated before traveling, but um, this is you know, important to take a look at. Uh, New York does recommend for anybody who travels internationally that you are tested within three to five days upon returning to New York, no matter whether or not you are an international travel or, dom or domestic traveler, just, just get tested. Or if you're fully vaccinated or not fully vaccinated. Um, finally, we've had some more news about the governor's uh, issues. There, on April 13th, and this was all uh, put forward by the New York Times yesterday, but on April 13th, the comptroller, Tom DiNapoli, formally referred a potentially criminal investigation into the governor uh, to the attorney general, attorney general Letitia James. Um, this is going, this inquiry will be focusing on the alleged use of state staff and state resources when writing his book in 2020. Um, the public officer's law broadly prohibits uh, elected officials and state uh, employees from using property services or other resources of the state for private business or other compensated non-governmental purposes. So this has been, this clause has taken down a lot of other people before, took down a prior comptroller. Um, so there are now four investigations into the governor. There are two investigations being handled by the state attorney general, one federal investigation about the uh, about nursing homes, and then you have the assembly impeachment inquiry, which is focusing on all of the above. Um, so that is my update. I, uh, you know, I'll see you next week. Thanks, Katie. Appreciate, appreciate the update from Albany. Obviously, a lot going on right now at the governor's office. Thanks again to all of our presenters today. Thanks to you, our audience. We're glad to have you, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. Again, please take the time to complete the survey at the end. It's helpful, and we do review that information every week. Thanks again. Have a great day. Take care.